Welcome everyone, Pradiyagak. It's very, very exciting for us to be here at this very first event in our new space. We're grateful to the Tanyelian family of London for donating the space to us for three years. We're extremely lucky and uh, we are thoroughly enjoying it. With the, as someone mentioned when they came in, we've got windows now, we've got running water, we've got color. <laughs> And I'd like to all um, add it, thank Kayvon, who is with us tonight, who was our architect and doing all kinds of designs and figuring out what could go where without him, it would have been really, really difficult. Thank you, Kayvon. And uh, many, many people, many people need to be thanked for this. So it's, a, it's also an honor to be the person welcoming you, uh, Datavid, which is very much that she could be here, our director. But there's an ambassador's dinner tonight, and we thought we better send our first in command <laughs> to, to that. So she's really sorry to miss tonight's, but she'll certainly watch it on, on uh, YouTube or whatever we call this stuff. Nick is going to introduce our speaker tonight, and I just wanted to say thank you also to the National Lottery Heritage Fund, which has given us a um, very generous grant for these three years, two and a half years, whatever it is. And we are using it daily, I must say. And we're so grateful to them for their generosity. Uh, it's gone into all aspects and particularly into hiring our new staff. And that has made such a big difference for us, as I'm sure you've noticed if you follow us online or in any other way, that uh, we're very fortunate to have people like Nick, I'll tell you who is our new, not new anymore, program manager. And now the others have gone to take care of whatever happened out there, Olivia and Shahika. Um, we're missing, Noosh is online, taking care of us. Like from, there. Noosh, hi there, <laughs> she's weird to put her up there. Yeah, Noosh, thanks. And Dr. Lee, of course. We're lucky to have Arda with us tonight, who's one of our hard working trustees and honestly, our trustees have never worked harder, I have to say. They, they really, there's so much to do now. And we are all grateful to all of you as well. So after all these many thanks, let's turn over to our, what we're doing tonight, which is our very first event. Yeah. So Nick, over to you. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, and thank you to all of you for joining us here in person. And thank you to everyone joining us on the Zoom, uh, and also everyone who will be watching this afterwards on our YouTube channel. Uh, we really value the uh, global community that we've been able to be part of and develop since uh, this isolating pandemic began about over a year and a half ago. Um, and we really intend to uh, continue providing for this global community. So this is a first attempt. Some things may go wrong um, and we ask your uh, patience with that. Um, and But we really also would love, uh, we'll be sharing uh, later on uh, at the end of the talk, a, a feedback form um, and any feedback that you can give us for how to improve this experience so that it's still just as participatory uh, and intimate um, for all our friends who are joining us from around the world. Uh, as Susan said, my name is Nick Patho and I'm the programme manager here at the Armenian Institute. And for the first time in my nine month tenure so far, I can actually mean here in the Armenian <laughs> Institute. Uh, and it's uh, a real pleasure, uh, if also a solemn occasion to introduce uh, the event tonight. This event marks one year since the uh, assault on uh, the Republic of Nagorno Karabakh, Artsakh, uh, that began 27th of September last year. Uh, and we, like many of our friends, families, and communities, are still reeling from that devastating uh, and re traumatizing event. And um, the ramifications of the new status quo uh, continue to. Um, settle and see more and more unsettled uh, every day. And so we send our love and our solidarity to all those who are suffering, who've lost ones, who don't know where their loved ones are, uh, or who have been traumatized in one way or another by the events last year. Although we are still coming to terms with what happened, we feel the responsibility as a leading Armenian diaspora organization uh, focus on the culture and the arts to find some way to meaningfully respond to what happened. 
Um, and so as an organization with a mission to make Armenian history and culture a living experience, we felt that it was in the issue of heritage that we could begin to contribute to some kind of response uh, and some kind of mobilization. Um, so there's no one better who we could have with us tonight uh, to begin, well, not to begin, but to continue the conversations that we started already last year um, during and after the war about, uh, about heritage in Artsakh and Karabakh, and that's Simon Marakian. Uh, Simon is a Denver-based political scientist, human rights activist, uh, and uh, investigative journalist and researcher. Um, and he has a number of very impressive accolades. I won't list them all so that we have plenty of time for discussion uh, and uh, uh, to hear what Simon has to say. Um, but I really encourage you to go and have a look at his bio on our website or on the Facebook event um, so that you can see just uh, how impressive his work has been. Um, but one thing I will really mention relevant for tonight was Simon's um, groundbreaking co-authored piece uh, in Hyperallergic magazine on the cultural destruction uh, implemented by the Azerbaijani uh, state in Nakhchivan and particularly in the Julfa Cemetery. Um, and there's a project online, I think the website is julfa.com, um, which people can go and see uh, what the situation is there. Um, but I won't take up any more of your time. Welcome everyone in person, welcome everyone uh, watching around the world and welcome us all some more, please. Thank you for the kind introduction, Nick, and Susan and team for hosting me for tonight's event. I also like to thank the Gulbenkian Foundation for sponsoring my doctoral studies in heritage crime and the Armenian Diocese of London for also hosting me. It's a great honor to be here with you all. Uh, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but we have uh, some prominent individuals uh, among us who are not from the Armenian community, but are certainly concerned about this issue. Uh, we have Lawrence as a, a prominent scholar on the Caucasus, and Felix, who directs Forum 18, which is a prominent uh, institution dedicated to religious freedom across the world. And I'm going to talk about an issue that's near and dear to my heart, and uh, it's cultural preservation and politics of cultural preservation. What I'll do is to review what has happened in the region so far. First, the destruction of Armenian monuments in the exclave of Nahi Javan, then talk about the Islamic monuments under Armenian control that also had some level of damage uh, before this current war, and then talk about what's going on in Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh and the wider region today and in the future. So, the first slide shows an image taken from the Iranian border in December of 2005, when Azerbaijan's military had been deployed to the world's largest field of medieval khachkars or intricately carved cross stones, where Jufa merchants and their families had been memorialized for centuries. This was the world's largest medieval army cemetery. I was 19 at the time, so at the age of the soldiers or near so when they were deployed to wipe out Armenian history. And it was really striking that despite having hot footage of uh, ongoing destruction, there was very muted response from the international community. Armenia was unable to even raise the issue um, effectively in international fora, and Azerbaijan kept denying this. And so I felt it was upon me to tell the story of Julfa and I concentrated on this for, um, for also a personal reason, because my father, as a young man, had visited the cemetery during the Soviet era with his Azerbaijani friends. He was not allowed to take photographs, but others before him were. And so we have some of the two of the uh, famous Jufa Khachkars before their destruction photographed in 1915. I also visited the area myself in 2013 from across Iran's border. You see the flat field uh, uh, in, the, in the background. Uh, and had it not been for my knowledge of the area or the documentation that I'd worked on, including satellite imagery analysis with the American Association for the Advancement of Science, I would not have guessed that anything existed in this land. It was just complete, a desolate grassland. But I also want to make sure that when we talk about the destruction of Nahi Javan's Armenian past, 
we're not just talking about Jufa because Jufa was our window to the destruction in part and mostly because it was accessible uh, for viewing and monitoring from Iran's territory, whereas the rest of the monuments were spread deep inside Nafi Javan. And so in 2018, uh, I approached Sarah Pickman, who, who with, with whom I had worked earlier on a short film, and I asked her to work together to tell the full story of the destruction that had taken place, not just in Jufa, but across the region. We utilized four primary uh, or primarily four type of sources, geospatial data. And I'd already done work with the AAAS, as I mentioned earlier. In 2009, uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science was working on something called Science for Human Rights, when they utilized geospatial technology to look at crises in Darfur and other parts across the world to document humanitarian crises. But this was the first time when they actually looked at cultural destruction as a case of human rights documentation. I've later uncovered other materials that were published earlier, or actually this summer in the art newspaper magazine here, uh, right here in, in London. We also utilize visual crowdsourcing. Those are imagery that exist today, uh, whether deliberately photographed or tourist materials or some other social media photographs that we can overlay with historical images of Nafi Javan. There are also eyewitness uh, testimonies, not only from uh, individuals who witnessed the destruction from across the border in Iran, but also by prominent Azerbaijanis like Akram al -Isli. We finally use state decrees and publications because there are official publications in Azerbaijan concerning the destruction that we'll go over later on. And there's also some other materials published by Akram al -Isli, including his own telegram to Haydar Aliyev. Now, uh, just to show some examples of the sources we've used. So here's the eyewitness testimony. In 2005, a Scottish researcher, Stephen Sim, visited uh, Nafi Javan. He was only allowed to stay for a day before what, is, what would have been called KGB in the Soviet era uh, kicked him out. And he visited Sub Karapet, uh, St. John the Baptist Church, and this is what he found. Instead of the church, this is what the locals pointed to when he asked about the church. Argam Ayvazian had taken a photograph of that in the 70s and 80s. He was a researcher who spent most of his life going back and forth to Nafi Javan to document the Armenian past. Interestingly enough, a European traveler, without having knowledge of the destruction, took a photograph of the same site later on, and we see that a mosque has been built in place of it. Um, and next slide. Sorry. And I want to clarify that the churches were not destroyed to build mosques. There are only two examples where mosques have been built in lieu of them, with the other one being in Agulis or Ailis. And actually, in his newest essay, Akram Aylisli writes that most of the locals boycott the mosque in protest of the destruction of the church that had happened. If you read uh, the English translation of his tri uh, or the three novellas, there is an essay in which he says, a mosque built in place of a destroyed church, prayers in that mosque do not reach the ears of Allah. Um, there is another image of Agulis. This is the hometown of uh, Akram Ayristi, the Azerbaijani author who currently lives under house arrest. His novella, Stone Dreams, documents the churches that he saw as a young person growing up in the city. You have some beautiful landscape Photographs, photographs that have been preserved, uh, especially featuring the most prominent of the monastic complexes, St. Tom, uh, Thomas, or Sub Tovma in Armenian, which, according to local tradition, was built by or established by uh, uh, Bartholomew the Apostle in honor of his newly martyred colleague who had been visiting India. But it was built into a cathedral in later centuries and uh, <laughs> underwent a major renovation in the 17th century. And I found in uh, visual crowdsourcing in social media, this image that shows the mosque that I replaced this. This is the mosque I referenced earlier that I come at least it says locals have been boycotting. Now, as I mentioned in uh, art newspaper, 
uh, I published a series of new geospatial materials which were declassified satellite imagery that the Soviets and the, uh, the Americans used against each other. In 2011, the US declassified one of its programs with which I was able to find and identify the eight churches of Agulis memorialized by Akram Lisli. And I received much help from the Caucasus Heritage Watch out of Cornell and Purdue universities to show this documentation. In some ways, I wanted to authenticate the work of Akram Lisli, whom Azerbaijan's government considers a liar. Uh, speaking more on uh, other sources, here is the telegram published uh, in, I think, 2012 by Akram Lisli, but he had sent it to uh, Heydar Aliyev in 1997. This is when he witnessed the destruction of the churches of Agulis. He protested it, but he did not speak uh, directly about it until later years. Azerbaijan's own public decrees that are available online do reference the destruction. The final phase of the destruction took place starting on December the 6th, 2005. The first stage was in 1997, with an uh, internal stage in, in 2002, 2003. But the final stage was in 2005. This is after Azerbaijan had had a new president, the current president, Ilham Aliyev, who felt much more emboldened by having just launched the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline, taking uh, Azerbaijani oil, who had made a much better uh, rapport with the UNESCO uh, chief at the time, giving him a medal and potentially or possibly uh, an offer for a job, which he was for retirement, a trustee of a, a state-based propaganda organization called Baku Center for Multiculturalism. Now, in this December uh, 2005 order, there is no word, the word Armenian does not exist. Uh, if you read it, it just talks about passportization, which is a Soviet term, of all the monuments on the territory of Nakhichevan for the purpose of proving that they are Turkic. Passportization basically meant conducting excavations, writing their descriptions, and re recording them, and issuing an official document about their existence. So even though there is no direct reference to Armenians, uh, there was a follow-up report published officially in 2008, co-edited by Naki Javan's local autocrat, a uh, relative of the Aliyev regime, Vasif Talibov, whom some locals in Naki Javan called, called Talibanov. In this encyclopedia, they summarized the findings of the report uh, ordered by the public decree in 2005. And it's a bilingual encyclopedia in English and in Azerbaijani. And in, in, in there they say uh, the real purpose of this investigation. Armenians demonstrating hostility against us not only have an unjust land claim, but also are installed their monuments by giving biased information to the international community. Um, the health investigations once again prove that the land of Nakhchivan belonged to the Azerbaijani Turks and their forefathers over the period of history. Interestingly enough, a side note, Azerbaijan aspires to a more multicultural, more sophisticated ethnic background, not just made of Turkic ancestry, but the historiography and the ethnic construction and the identity construction is rather different in Nakhchivan for political reasons mostly. In summary, uh, we looked at the number of monuments that had been preserved up until 1987. This is when the last time Argam Ayvazian visited Naki Javani was not allowed to return after that. He had documented 89 standing churches, although originally there had been many more, 5,840 uh, cross stones, a majority of which were in Jura or Julfa, and over 22,000 tombstones spread, spread across um, uh, 89 or so cemeteries, according to Ayvazian's research. He claims that he was able to find every Armenian stone. However, the December uh, 2005 order by Avasif Talibo uh, gives actually uh, decrees to go and conduct some sort of excavations in, in more remote areas as well. So it's possible that this, the numbers are more, but these are the monuments that we are aware of. 
And according to all the sources we looked at, the number of those monuments is zero, zero, zero. Azerbaijan's government does not deny this. They say there's no Armenian monuments. Of course, there are none because Armenians never lived there. And the latest denial was published uh, in response to uh, my Arden's favorite piece in, in June. So what are the motivations for the erasure? Uh, of course, for outsiders, the first thing they say, it must have been revenge uh, by the Azerbaijanis for losing the first Karabakh war in which over half a million Azerbaijanis became refugees and lost their homes and access to their sacred sites. Um, others within Azerbaijan say it was more of a power projection for the domestic audience to boost Aliyev regime's legitimacy because anti-Armenian belligerence was the only recipe he had uh, to connect, to have rapport with his constituents. Um, Arif Yunus has an interesting uh, quote in the hyperallergic investigation mentioned earlier in which he says that nothing projects power for the Aliyev regime like committing cultural genocide in Nahijavan than showering in international praises of tolerance. But I should also note that the domestic oppression was not only against Armenians. You know, any mention of Persian history in Nakhijavan has been wiped out. It's all about or, or Arab uh, uh, history, which is you know how the uh, uh, colonization of the Armenian homeland started was with first uh, the Arab was followed by by later ones. Uh, but it's all about Turkic history, and it's all about eliminating any public discourse. So. At the same time that the Armenian monuments were erased for, uh, in the final stage, most tea houses or chaihanas in Nakhijavan were also destroyed or closed down so that the government could control uh, the public spaces in which people could have a conversation. Now, Armenians will say that this is all about final erasure of Armenians. It's, you know, it's, it's the next step, the next stage. Uh, of the Armenian genocide and the ultimate nationalistic Turkey goal of, of wiping out Armenians. Now, there, there's truth to all three uh, perspectives and uh, uh, analyses. However, I want, want to add a fourth one, which may be surprising at first. But I strongly suspect that this was also down to impress upon Turkey and in some ways to defend Azerbaijan's own sovereignty against Turkey as well. Because in 1997, Turkey and Azerbaijan signed a military treaty uh, that was their very first major alliance document. And even though, especially as we saw in this past war, uh, Turkey is Azerbaijan's staunchest ally, Turkey has territorial expansionist goals and dreams and Nakhijavan is the easiest target for them under the 1921 Treaty of Moscow. It's a Turkish protectorate. It makes much more sense for it to be part of Turkey because it has a common border with that. It'll probably be better for the local population, although the best thing for the local population would be trade with Yerevan. That's where how they historically operated. Um, so in some ways, I believe, in addition to the other three reasons, uh, uh, Turk, Azerbaijan's government wanted to show to the Turks that we can be worse than you when it comes to erasing Armenians. We can do a much better job. You know, you still have some churches left. We're going to wipe everything out. There is no need for you to take over this land. We, 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 we got this. Now, coming back to what's happening today, I'm going to start off with a map of uh, what is left of Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh following the recent war and the monuments around it that have been deemed either destroyed or threatened so far by Caucasus Heritage Watch, the organization I referenced earlier, which is based at Cornell and Purdue. I believe yesterday or the day before they just uh, published their second report, which is very interesting because in there they're outlining what they plan to do over the next few months. Uh, for the rest of the year. But they're looking at 275 sites in Nagorno and around Nagorno Karabakh uh, 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 outside the uh, Russian peacekeeping borders, so outside uh, the Republic. And they are looking at not just Armenian monuments, but Islamic monuments as well, because one of the monuments that was destroyed after Azerbaijan. Uh, uh, got control of, uh, of so much land 
was a mosque in Aigek uh, or FN village, most likely mistaken for an Armenian church or another Armenian structure. But it's also important to talk about the Azerbaijani perspective and, and the suffering in the first war. Here I am climbing a bridge to nowhere in Ardam in 2014, which was a formerly Azerbaijani populated town that was turning into a, a ghost town. And a lot of times when Azerbaijan is challenged with the destruction of Armenian monuments, you know, this is what they'll show. They'll say, well, see what Armenians have done to our cities and whatnot. So I think it's important to acknowledge the pain and suffering of Azerbaijanis. It's all important to talk about the damage to Islamic monuments, but understand the context and the degree of, of what had happened. So following the, during and following the war, we saw images of Azerbaijani mosques and other sacred sites emerge in Azerbaijani social media uh, or on Turkish TV. And a lot of times they showed uh, intact buildings, but used for purposes other than sacred sites like sheltering animals or animals finding them as natural habitats. So obviously uh, desecration and, and, and in some ways a neglect by a state, but obviously much better uh, left neglected than completely erased like we saw in um, Nahi Javan. Interestingly enough, uh, Azerbaijani officials have an, a number of mosques they say were raised to the ground. Uh, they say there were 67 mosques, 73 of which were either just completely wiped out or damaged severely. Uh, in fact, the only mosque that has been completely wiped out in the region was uh, the one in Efendilej or Aigek. Uh, to the right, you see the mosque that Azerbaijani officials were saying Armenians had desecrated. And after what they consider the mosque liberation was completely flattened. Now, just because Azerbaijan's government uh, uh, lies uh, about cultural behavior does not mean that the Armenian government always tells the truth. Uh, uh, and so I've looked at about 40 mosques uh, in the region, most of which are rather intact, with one exception of a mosque in Fizuli that was likely destroyed in 2016 and almost completely destroyed, although remnants of that remain. Uh, in the last report, Caucasus Heritage Watch also mentioned that they're going to look at the Islamic monuments under Armenian control, and, and so that they have a more objective, a more broader understanding of what's going on. So some of the motivations for desecrating Islamic monuments um, include, you know, just like in the uh, Nahi Javan uh, destruction theory, revenge might have been uh, part of that, looting uh, has, has been a major part of some of the vandalism that has happened at, at, at some of the Islamic cemeteries and state neglect, yeah, with exception, with some exceptions, like the rebuilding of the largest mosque in Shushi that Armenians renovated, not rebuilding, but renovation in 2019. So that brings us to today, what's going on and um, I'm gonna talk about the current cultural policy in Nagorno-Karabakh. I think everyone knows, especially Armenians, that the Aliyev regime's long-term goal is final erasure of Armenians in the region. We, we know that there is no need to, you know, convince others uh, uh, of that. Although a lot of times international observers will like to just say, well, you know, both sides have done something wrong. Um, so there's, there's this idea that there is an equivalence when it comes to a cultural policy. Uh, and, I, and I don't think there, there is because there is no motivation on the part of the Armenian government to, to wipe out Azerbaijan heritage. In fact, it, it's very bad uh, for Armenians' state interests to, to do that, uh, arguably for Azerbaijan too. But let's talk about what, what is Azerbaijan actually doing today. Now, uh, there's been destruction of several uh, cemeteries already, two houses of worship, and smaller khachkars that are so hard to to monitor, but actually Azerbaijan is doing something much more complicated. It's trying to do three things. And I'm gonna use this analogy of good cop, bad cop, populist cop. So on one hand, Azerbaijan is trying to convince the international community that it's a responsible and tolerant country that can take care of its own uh, region without having help from Russians. In other words, they are trying very hard 
to incentivize Russian withdrawal, the Russian peacekeepers withdrawal when their time expires in four and a half years. That's why we have not seen a large scale wipeout of Armenian monuments right away. At the same time, it has to do what it did in uh, Azerbaijan, which is the populist cop, and that's use anti-Armenian belligerence for domestic legitimacy. It, it's, it's, it wants to keep up the wave of euphoria uh, that exists, existed in Azerbaijan after winning the war. Uh, but most importantly, it's playing the role of a bad cop, because if you look at the actions that happen locally in, in the region, uh, there, there is a concentrated effort to demoralize the remaining Armenians into self-exile. This doesn't get reported a lot, but I've spoken to folks who have been in, in Stepanakert in recent weeks. There are drones flying over sleeping civilians every night just to just terrorize them, you know, to, to the point where, you know, you would not want to, to live there anymore. They have cut off water, electricity. So everything is being done for Armenians to just say, you know what, I, want, I only have one life. It's not worth doing this. I'm just going to move to Armenia or Russia or whatnot. So three things that Azerbaijan has to balance up uh, for, for right now. Now, there certainly... Uh, reasons that may change Azerbaijan's behavior. If, if Russia makes it clear that it's not gonna leave right away, you know, so Azerbaijan may not need the good cop image anymore as much. There, there might be other factors, but everything else being equal, we are gonna uh, see complete wipeout of Armenian history unless we, we do something about it. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanna illustrate uh, the good cop and, you know, the bad cop analogy in, in the renovation of Shushi's Vazan Chetzot's cathedral, the largest cathedral, thank you, in, uh, in, in this town, in the city. As many of you know, it was bombarded twice, October the 8th, uh, with air precision strikes that were more than likely deliberate. And I predicted in one of my pieces, I think it was in Asia Times in November, that they would be renovating this church as a token preservation building because of its age. It was built in the 1860s, which fits the Azerbaijani narrative because Azerbaijan's government claims that Armenians did not show up in the region until after 1828, the Turkmenchai Treaty between Persia and Russia. And so it is the perfect church uh, to preserve. And obviously it had become um, so well known because of the airstrike against it. However, what I did not predict uh, was that its iconic umbrella-like dome uh, would be dismantled, uh, for which I use the analogy of beheading the, the, the church in the renovation process to bring it back to the look of that post-1920 massacre or pogrom look of the city, which is when the Armenian population of Shushi was minoritized. So on one hand, Azerbaijan is playing a good cop to the international community saying, see, we are renovating the church. On the other hand, it's, it's still able to play a bad cop to Armenian to demoralize them because it's showing us that the only way in which an Armenian church might exist is in a post-1920 massacre look. In fact, it's actually even worse than just the, the dome part. If you follow Ilham Aliyev's rhetoric, he only acknowledges the existence of one Armenian church of this church and doesn't acknowledge the other 160 so churches that are now under Azerbaijan's control as Armenian because of the Caucasian Albanian uh, theory that if we have time, we can talk a little more about. Now, during the war, we saw, uh, uh, next slide. During the war, we saw Azerbaijani social media users, publicized images, uh, vandalism, shooting in clutch cars, toppling them, climbing on top of churches. Uh, Coxus Heritage Watch, as I mentioned earlier, has documented the destruction of two cemeteries. Uh, one is in Metz Tave in the occupied Hadrut region. You can see they have built a road through the cemetery, but instead of just uh, destroying that section of the cemetery, that destroyed the, the entire cemetery, um, which apparently is more tolerated uh, because we haven't heard major any major international organization make a noise about this than you know targeting of houses of worship. 
Uh, and the next slide also shows the destruction of another cemetery in Serna, <coughs> which similarly under the pretext of, of, of construction appears to have been wiped out uh, or uh, at least to some degree. Uh, yeah, especially in the, in the July imagery um, uh, for you know, the same demoralizing purposes. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that there, there is a large attention paid to, to the Hazard region in particular, which um, was always part of uh, an autonomous Armenian area, it was part of the Nagorno-Karabakh autonomous oblast. So Azerbaijan really has no territorial claim except that you know, it should be within its boundaries, but it has no administrative claim to it. This has always been part of an autonomous Armenian area. And, and, and this is where most Armenians in this past war were ethnically cleansed for, uh, from about 40,000 people. There's also some Khachkars that are much harder to spot, uh, like uh, Caucasus Heritage Watch reached out to me to try to find this Khachkar in the Hadrid region, but exists under a sacred tree. And so the tree uh, shade and the tree leaves have been covering it up. And it's been hard to find out the status of this. But uh, we have seen in rhetoric uh, in Azerbaijan, social media, in some, some government link circles, that Khachkars are not tolerated for existence. During and after the war, a new conspiracy theory emerged in Azerbaijan that Khachkars are uh, artificially aged monuments um, that are not even, you know, authentic to start with. And this kind of makes sense because unlike churches, Khachkars are completely unique to Armenian culture. The other uh, uh, local Christians of the region, the Caucasian Albanians who have been long gone and Georgians, they have not created Khachkars. So Khachkars are distinctly Armenian and that's why they are going to become and are now a primary target for destruction. But other important Armenian monuments are currently being tolerated and preserved for years. Azerbaijan's government has been proclaiming. Tizernavank, one of the uh, earliest basilicas built in the region as Caucasian Albanian. So there is intermittent hope for its preservation in the short term. Same for Vankasar, which was actually renovated by Soviet Azerbaijanis in the Soviet era, during which the Armenian lettering was carved out or polished out. Uh, it's next to the Tigranaket archaeological site, which is a touchy subject for Azerbaijan because the uh, excavations there were, were deemed uh, uh, illegal by the Azerbaijani government. So they, they seem to have an incentive of, of having more presence and probably some destruction in this area. Uh, Caucasus Heritage Watch has shown some of the, um, um, some of the military equipments that have been installed in, in this area. And finally, uh, the last slide shows Darivan, which, is, which has become, I guess, the most famous sacred site. It's right outside the borders of the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast, which was the autonomous region of Artsakh uh, under Soviet Azerbaijan. And as you know, Russians in the beginning were helping Armenian pilgrims to keep visiting it. But since May 2nd, uh, they have not been allowed to be there. Currently, six monks live there. Uh, and if they live, they're not allowed to come back. So we'll see how long their presence will continue. Darivan is very interesting. It's a uh, you know, 13th century monument, although some parts of it are, are older. And it's covered in Armenian lettering that documents the region's history, uh, the interesting families that were involved in, in its building, in its preservation. There's uh, some, by some count, up to 200 Armenian inscriptions. And so Azerbaijan will have to polish them out in, in their mind, in their Caucasian Albanian myth of, uh, of converting Armenian monuments. Now, some might say, well, it's better to do this than to just wipe out everything. So some might perceive the Caucasian Albanian myth as a tactic of preservation. It's, it's a very wishful thinking, but it's probably not a, a, a correct thinking because all the churches of Nakhijevan starting the 50s were called Caucasian Albanian. The locals were raised with the idea that those were Caucasian Albanian, AKA 
somehow, somehow Azerbaijani churches. Although later on in the 90s, the Caucasian Albanian theory was really downplayed in Nakhijaban because the idea of Azerbaijani Turks, that, that ethnicity became the, the common uh, thread in, in the discussions among the society or at least in public circles. So Caucasian Albanian, which is that extinct nation that has not been around for at least a thousand years, ascribing Armenian monuments to, to that culture is really a first step in their eventual destruction unless and until some steps are taken by Armenians and others to try to reverse the politics of erasure in the region. Well, I think that's a perfect point on which to finish. And then uh, an hopeful one means that there, that there is agency in grassroots action, people mobilizing, uh, and that there are some ways beyond these boundaries. So thank you so much, Simone. Uh, Just before um, everyone on the Zoom goes and everyone here can have a glass uh, of wine or any refreshments of their choosing, um, just a couple of things. Firstly, if you uh, enjoyed the event today or if you have suggestions for how we can improve it, please do give your feedback in the form that's just been shared. Everyone here can uh, accost us in person. Um, and uh, if you value the work of the Armenian Institute, then we can only do it uh, with the support of our friends and our benefactors. So um, there's a link to our support us page shared in the chat. And just finally, um, for everyone, uh, we are able to announce today that next week we'll have the second in our uh, of two events marking uh, the year of the Black anniversary of the beginning of the conflict, conflict last year. Um, Susan mentioned earlier that we have a new ambassador here in the United Kingdom, His Excellency Varujan Mersesyan, uh, who was previously the ambassador to the United States. His first public appearance will be with the Armenian Institute next Tuesday at 7 p.m. It will be entirely online um, and it's uh, by registration only. So please do watch out for that announcement when the link goes live um, and uh, we'll be able to hear from him his reflections on the conflict uh, and on the situation now. Um, but Thank you again to Simon and thank you everyone for joining us uh, and we hope to see you again next time.